And quarterback Jack Douglas makes the play. Whopper would then find itself down 12 to nothing, but the cheerleaders were ready for some action as Anthony Jennings would stir things up with a great run from his fullback position as number 34 bangs ahead for the first down. Sean Gray is then with just an incredible run. Watch the fake as he falls, gets up, and takes off. It's 12 to 7. Wofford has come back in the ballgame. The Terriers would go 75 yards in six plays, capped off by another incredible run by Sean Gray. Watch the fake. Three guys touch him, but he scores the touchdown. Coach Mike Ayers then decides to go for two. Alex Holzpaw, the sophomore halfback from Elizabethan, Tennessee, just gets into the corner of the end zone, and it's 15 to 12. The Wofford Terriers have taken the lead, but then disaster would strike. Taurus Forney of the Citadel Bulldogs with the kickoff return. Would he get... That guy, watch. 50, there is nothing but clear sailing. But somehow, Chad Starks runs him down and knocks him out of bounds around the 10-yard line. But the Wofford Terriers still had one more miracle to pull. Defensive back Chad Starks breaks on the ball and comes up with the biggest interception of his young career. Starks takes it back as the clock runs down and the Wofford Terriers hang on for a 15-12 thriller. Later, Starks talked about his big play. So, the As you can tell, there's a couple things that have changed since back in the 90s. But the one thing about this guy, when he was a player, uh, he had a ton, a ton of one-two. He had, uh, he had the attitude. It didn't matter where it was. He would chase it. He would chase it, and he would chase it. Uh, the big thing that we all understand now: anybody that intercepts a ball right there at the end, what are you going to do? Get on the ground. That's right. Okay. <laughs> I did a poor job coaching him back then, but. Uh, we're uh, glad to have him. Uh, he is uh, a professor now at Delaware State. Uh, and uh, what's the deal with the astronaut deal? Uh, I'm the associate director of the NASA um, Space Command. Yeah. yeah. We'll talk about that. In a yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you, Coach. Yes, sir. Um, before I begin talking, I want to make one correction about not being coached up. I'm sure y'all heard that language before, right? Um, I just was a hard head. We actually talked about that in practice all the time, about the responsibility I had whenever I got an interception. And um, my issue was I thought I was a little uh, more talented with offensive skill sets than my coaches did. And the opportunity, any opportunity I got, my hands on the ball, I was trying to take it to the house. I was begging someone to let me return punts and kickoffs as a freshman, but of course we had this, this all-American named Tony Shea here, and I hadn't earned and I hadn't did, and I hadn't earned my opportunity in that space and time to get afforded that opportunity. And my goal was to get on the field. Believe it or not, when I signed up here, my only goal was to make the traveling squad. I happened to be blessed with a few accolades in basketball, some in the classroom, as well as on the football field. But when I was coming into this environment, I only wanted to contribute by being on the practice field. That was it. But when I got here, there was an opportunity. When I got on the field, when I got in the film room, I realized that the opportunity that I needed was given to me when I signed on February 14th on Valentine's Day in 1990, and that was the only one that I needed. They believed in me. I had the opportunity. The ball was given to me in retrospect at that moment. And it was up to me to take advantage of it and take it to the house. So actually taking it to the house was the opportunity to show and impress upon my coaches that I deserved to have a starting spot. And I was fortunate enough from the 92 team that went to the playoffs that year to be the only freshman starting on that defense. And I started off third on that depth chart. 
There were some injuries because those things happened in football. And I got a chance to start in the first scrimmage as a freshman. Didn't perform that well. I acted just like a freshman. But I was granted the opportunity to be a nickelback starting in the first game. And um, I got, what's the word we call trucked? <laughs> I got trucked in my first play on the field. Some decent laughter, but you know what it did, right? When, when all of us have that anxiety and that nervousness before kickoff starts, what does it usually take for you to get right? That one hit. And after that, that one hit, then I made my one hit. And then I felt okay about where I was. We're going to put that part of the tape on pause, and I want to start off about introducing myself and tell you a little bit about me, and a little bit about where I'm from, and a little bit about how I got to certain spaces, and where I am now, and where I plan on going for the future. And hopefully some of this can resonate with where you are now, where some of you are from, and where you plan on taking your future. I'm born and raised in Columbia, South Carolina. I'm a proud native of the dirty, as we like to say. Um, I'm one of five children. I have three older brothers and one older sister, so as we like to say, I am the baby. Um, I don't think I was poor. I don't think I was treated like a baby, but my mom has a different type of memory and conversation than what I had. Um, I didn't have a great relationship with my father growing up. I had no relationship with my father. My mother was one of 14. She picked cotton for a living. My grandfather owned cotton fields. The race relations and the whole political culture and environment was very different in South Carolina than what it is now. My mother used to tell me stories growing up as a child that when she picked cotton, she used to have to lay down in the fields when the school bus came around because my grandfather wouldn't let her go to school. It was about survival before education. She graduated as a valedictorian of her class, even with missing those days out of school. She put education as a priority, even though she wasn't even allowed to go to school. My grandfather was teaching her a value system about work ethic. Work ethic. Even without formal training, even without textbooks, even without the opportunity to excel on the educational level that we say gives you an opportunity to be much more successful and there's one opportunity we have in life. Walking across campus in graduate school about six years ago, I realized what my grandfather had sacrificed for me in order for me to be a part of this thing called success. The values that he gave my mother had no option but to bleed down to me. I realized that the race relations in the 1950s and the 1960s were great opportunities for learning experiences for a man like me growing up in the South with our relationship with his father. And let me tell you what I mean by that. My grandmother corrected my grandfather one day when they were selling the bales of cotton to one of the white landowners. She said, hey, don't you ever, 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 ever correct me in front of a white man again. She was confused. They get back in the truck. She said, Daddy, but he was cheating me. He turns and looks at her and says, what makes you think I didn't know that? This was the only way that he could feed the family. Can you imagine your pride, your identity, working hard, lazy, and you have to take this type of disrespect in order to feed 14 children? Some of us cry about getting up going to the 8 o'clock class. I was dead. Some of us cry about actually walking from this, practice, from this locker room down to that practice field. I ain't never had to pick no cotton. I ain't never had to worry about whether or not I could eat. We didn't have any money, but that value system of survival, my grandfather gave my mother, she made sure I got it. I woke up one day and said, if he can be successful in that environment, it ain't nothing stopping me but me. Culture changed. Legislation got passed. 1954, Brown versus Board of Education gave us an opportunity for us to be in this room together right now. Right now. That's why it happened. It happened for integration. 
And I prefer the resource evaluations to be distributed, distributed amongst people that never would have been given those opportunities. What did we what did I really have to be <coughs> upset about? Well, I found something. I found a number of things. I thought I was a very good kid. Had good grades, stayed out of trouble, I played ball, I went to church, but I couldn't figure out why I didn't have a relationship with my dad. I tried to do everything perfect so he would be proud of me. He had an alcohol problem. He had an anger problem. He had a commitment problem. He had a number of issues that I also was subjected to, like that bad system and that work ethic that my grandfather gave my mother. And when I realized that he didn't want to have a relationship with me, what do you think I did? I internalized that emotional pain, and I got angry. I got very angry. I got angry at people that were not deserving of it. I got angry at the world. I started feeling sorry for myself in retrospect now that I look back at it. But feeling sorry for myself and realizing that this is a reality, it's two different conversations. Because you have to deal with the emotion in order to grow from that pain in order to move past. So the first thing you have to do is to be honest with yourself about that emotion you feel. But anger allows you to mask the real emotion of hurt and respond in subjective to people that aren't worthy. So when I signed here in February 14th, I made a commitment. Them boys ain't where I'm from up there. They soft. I'm going to go to that school and show them what a real dude is. That's what I said. I come to Waffle College with all this anger because somebody owed me something. Even though I had no money to pay for school. Someone gave me an opportunity, but that was removed out of the conversation. I wasn't thinking about it that way then. I was young, dumb, and full of a lot of other stuff people talk about, right? I was in my own world, wallowing in my own pity, and not realizing the opportunity that I had been afforded. I came to school and had a 1.54 grade point average my first semester. I told Coach that I was going to Georgia Tech for the 3-2 program to be an engineer. Never wanted to play professional football. I didn't think that was part of my life trajectory. So I wasn't planning to come here to go play football. I came here to use football to get a quality education so I could take care of my mom and my community. That was never a part of what I played football for. At 14, she told me, you keep talking about this college thing. If you want to go, you have to earn a scholarship because we don't have any money. She was a custodian making $8,000 a year at Lee Park Elementary School. I moved eight times in 18 years because she kept depending on the same person that continuously let, her, let us down to take care of her. Manly responsibilities. I saw her struggle year after year after year. And I allowed myself to self-grandize and pull out some pity after all she was doing to give me the best opportunity she could. When I got to Waffle, I got introduced into a whole new culture. And I'm pretty sure some of you guys can feel the same way. This culture wasn't conducive, conducive to my childhood. So it made it very easy to lash out on those people that were different from me. It made it, it made it very easy to aspire to be different, to bring attention to the issues I thought needed to be talked about. It didn't go over too well. I love playing the game, but I also knew I can't go home. You get a 1.54 in your first semester, and you land on top of your bunk bed at home in Columbia, South Carolina over Christmas break. The first thing you say is, what am I going to do if I come back to the streets of Columbia, South Carolina? I know exactly what I'm going to do. Cracked up the street in 1984, 85 in California. What you think all my boys are doing? We turn 14, 15, 16, 17. Why am I the only one to go to college from my neighborhood? I brought one of my great childhood. I didn't bring him. 
One of my great childhood friends came to college with me. That was a sounding board to talk about, man, you can't go back to that. I know where you're from. At the time, though, I was invincible. Some of us are invincible at 18. Huh? I wasn't scared of that. The only thing I said, I ain't gonna let past for you anyway. That's what I thought. That's what I saw in my community. A lot of great athletes with a whole lot of problems, with a whole lot of failure. Why would I be different? Humble enough to say I'm not that different for them. But not self-confident to know that I have been blessed with a number of abilities that I need to take advantage of. I made a commitment when I got that letter. I ain't coming back home. Why? I was that mad about the culture of Waffle that I didn't want them to be right. I was just that angry that I made myself believe that they were actually putting up pictures of me as a bullseye and throwing darts at me. I made myself believe that I was going to make them white. A young black man from Columbia, South Carolina gets a scholarship to play football and he blows it in the first semester because he can't come in the classroom. I'm going to make them right. Came back in the spring. Signed up for 12 classes. Still with the engineer. I took one of the classes that I failed again. About a week after the drop ad period, Dr. Bass comes to me and says, Chad, we got 49 average. I'm not sure we're going to make it. Dr. Bass, what can I do? Can I stay out there? What can I do? He was like, well, you can do something. You can go talk to Coach about earning a WP in this class, and let's try to start this thing over. I earned a withdrawal pass. Came to coach and said, it's going to put me in a tough position. This means I won't be full-time student in the spring. This means I can't play the only thing that's going to get me the opportunity to do something for me, my family, and my community. And that's play spring football. Coach said, we don't have a choice. We got to do it. I did not play spring football my first year. I let me down. I let my mama down. I let my grandfather down. I let my teammates down. I signed that letter to come in to be a leader. In my mind, that's what I was doing. Oh, I had back, I had support. I walk in the cafeteria, Bill May. I might have 10, 15 with me. If I say let's meet outside in the front of the green, I might have 10, 15 with me. You walking back from the practice field, starts, what we gonna do tonight? What kind of leader was I when I left them? at the most vulnerable time when they needed me to be out there, and that's called spring ball. I wouldn't learn to be efficient. I wouldn't learn to execute. I was somewhat looking in a book, trying not to lose the only opportunity that was given to me by the same institution that I thought made me a target. I was wrong. I was young, dumb, and wrong. Some of us in this room I don't use those words to describe anyone other than myself. I'm fortunate enough to be an educator now. I don't believe anyone deserves that D word. But I think you get my point. I'm here today to talk to you about opportunities that are given to all of us. Not sure about the religious culture in the world, but I use a lot of analogies. And I think God dials up a lot of phone numbers. The question is whether or not you pick up the telephone and answer it. We all get an opportunity. Where are you when your number is being died? You can bring it back to football. You can be a reserve player. When the ACL goes on the start, coach lane turns to get the next man up, you dial in your phone number. Are you answering the call? I didn't answer the call my first year. It was tough. It was a real big transition. And it wasn't that I wasn't intelligent enough to make it in the classroom. It was about my childhood into an institution that made them responsible for what someone else didn't do. That wasn't on them. I was mad at the wrong person. I didn't understand how to deal with that pain. I grew up a man here at the College. I became a man here. I made a number of mistakes that I don't 
want you guys to make. That freshman year, those of you that have not set foot in Milk in the old main yet for a classroom, Donovan, mentioned two years ago, didn't we? Sat and ate lunch together doing camp, didn't we? I shared some of this with you, didn't we? How was that first year? Sometimes when you tell a baby to stove hot, they even have to touch it. But let's move away from what we call macro conversations about large numbers. You got one individual that takes this opportunity to say, I'm going to use convention as a methodology, not intervention, not treatment. Don't wait for it to happen to you to have to pull other people's resources together to come save you. We should be progressively moving forward, progressively thinking. I wasted a year of my life, of my teammates' life, of my mom, and what my granddad was looking down from heaven watching me. I wasted a year. I spent that next year making it up. Two years I lost. Two years. Some of this anger, when I say I subjected it to other people, I got into a couple physical altercations here at Waffle. Um, not proud about it, but these are lessons that y'all need to hear. I stayed in the principal's office. Who do you think the principal is? Who do you think the principal is? <laughs> How many of y'all have got 2 a.m. phone calls and being instructed to be in the old gym at 5.30 in the morning? There was a lot of things that my small mind and my small upbringing limited me from understanding when I got to all the college. There were some people in place that believed in me, that I made my enemy, that I had no idea how much love they had for me. They're in this room and they're in this campus and in this classroom. They're also alumni of this institution that we've been fortunate enough to become. Change not only ourselves, but change our family, change our generation. Let me say that again. They're in this room, they're in your classrooms, they're on this campus, and they're alumni of this institution. It affords us opportunity to not only change ourselves, but change our families, change our communities, and change our generation. I am the first generation father. I have a daughter. As a junior here, I helped contribute to taking a young lady's um, progression of adulthood. I got a young lady pregnant when I was a junior here at Walker College. Another one of my immature, dumb, irresponsible one thing about me is that I've been blessed with the hard head. I didn't know how to accept failure. So what do you think the first thing I thought about when I was informed I was going to be a father? I ain't going to do nothing like my dad. That opportunity made me grow up. I started going to Bilo, getting peaches at 2 o'clock in the morning. I stopped going to the parties and Bill May. I stopped doing a lot of stuff. Because my mama called me and she said, some girl called here crying talking about you're going to be a daddy. Did I teach you to be a little boy or did I raise you to be a man? You up there making man decisions, so guess what? Don't play with my grandchild. I don't want no crying grandchild. Now how can you not get a crying grandchild? Chad. Chad Starks, as she like to say when I'm getting those straight up lessons. She said, you do everything in your power to make that happen. Don't think about me. I was not responsible for two other lives. Ain't nobody taught me to take care of me, let alone take care of two other people. I wasn't ready for all of this. You're not ready for all this stuff that you think is glitz and glamour. It's the only time you get to be an undergrad. It's the only time you get to go to two-a-day camp. You don't want to turn around and live with regrets. 
You don't want to turn around and have these stories about woulda, shoulda, coulda. 1991 was a long time ago. 2013, it's going to eventually be a long time ago in your life. You want to take advantage of where you are right now. I don't think I was hard-headed, but I probably was. I'm not exactly sure who came back to tell me this is what I did. This is how you navigate certain spaces. I wasn't trusting the man that made me. He didn't care about me. How is another man that don't look like me that didn't help create me to love me? I wouldn't believe in that. I made a very, very rude comment to my coach one day. You don't care about me. I just play football for you. You sign my papers and I show up on practice and show up on Saturday. That's as far as this relationship needs to be. Well, I apologized for that comment some years ago. And that was one of the most growing pains that I experienced. I graduated from this college with a 2.27 GPA in the four years of life. A father of a one-year-old child. I didn't know what to do at that point. But guess what I didn't do? I didn't come back to Walker College to support the teammates that had helped me. I didn't come back to see those college professors that had believed in me and given me an opportunity that I just expressed to you. I was still blaming this institution for stuff they were not responsible for. I can't watch it, can't watch it give your life away like that. This opportunity I get to come back, it means the world to me. I'm all about preventing. Look in the mirror. Deal with some of those pain. It's okay to cry. It's okay to hurt. The problem comes is when you make other people responsible for that pain. My first name is Brian. My mother, you ever heard of Brian's song? Okay, yeah, I'm old. I'm tired. Y'all know that. So go watch Brian's song. It's a good movie. What's it, what is it about? <coughs> I'm back from there, Jeff All right. Who is this uh, teammate? Gail Sayre. Gail What's the story behind the relationship between the two? Roommates. Before that, they competed, right? Gail Sayers was the top running back. Piccolo may not make the team. Gail Sayers gets hurt. Piccolo falls out. Makes the team impressive. They become friends in the most uncomfortable way while the country was trying to keep everybody separate based on race. Brian Piccolo gets sick with leukemia. Guess who's at his bedside the entire time? The guy that was trying to take his job. Give you in those practices in that film room is life lessons about being a humanitarian, about taking care of your responsibilities being accountable. I don't do it for yourself. If I could shake my hand by myself, I wouldn't have to extend my right arm. He passed away. My mother goes to see that movie when she's pregnant with me. I'm a black dude, right? She wants me to be a ball player. I come from a family of sports. Doesn't it make sense that she should have named me what? Yeah. I don't realize this until about 15 years ago. The name of the white dude doing civil rights. <laughs> what is this black dad in the pink cotton thinking about? <laughs> <laughs> My full name is Brian Chad Stark. And that was the first opportunity she gave me to compete on paper without people being able to pass judgment. I confuse a whole lot of people on paper. Before I step in the room with a whole lot of dreadlocks and some earrings, I got an undergraduate degree from Walker College. That starts equaling out the, the, the scales. They start to balance out when you understand the historical reputation of what this institution means. Not just in the South, I mean international. I'm walking across campus one day after one of those principal office meetings, and I run into the principal again. 
Apparently, I was still on his mind because he walks up to me and says, son, what you going to do with yourself? I don't know, coach. We good. I'm still talking. <clears throat> what you mean what I'm going to do? But what do you like? Smart mouth again. Crime. He shakes his head like, what am I going to do with this kid? He said, okay. In my office tomorrow, two thirty. I go to his office. He hands me a business card. And on the card, it reads, attorney Charlie Jones. He said, they're waiting on you to call him. Oh, you still rest me for something? <laughs> <laughs> I know Coach ain't found out about what happened. <laughs> At least I got a private defense attorney, so the coach is looking out, right? <laughs> this is all going through my mind. I'm actually nervous and scared to dial this number up because I don't really know what's going on. Not being able to trust. He can't be looking out for me. Why would he? He don't really care about me that much and what happens in my life. Why would he? Folk that made me though. I called anyway. I know I had to see him again. Hello, this is Chad Starts, my speech to attorney Charlie Jones. Chad! How you doing? His voice was elevated. I'm like, okay, this is really exciting, but what's up? <laughs> he invites me to come to his office later on that afternoon. I didn't know Church Street. I get to Church Street, I walk in the office. Two doors. You go to the front door, then you go to the second door. When I get in the second door, there are balloons. And there are people standing up. And they started clapping. This is the office with three Wofford alumni, Mike Duncan, Richard Welcher, and Charlie Jones, and an ex-senator, may rest in peace, Harry Smith. And they all had managing staff. I didn't know all this at the time. The first thing that came out of their mouth is what? We watch him play football. That's all he knew. And he knew that the principal had endorsed me and given him a phone call. We're talking about coming from a structural inequality environment where I'm fighting to get in the classroom with no books. We're talking about being regulated where a ceiling has already been put on your life. And I don't even know. And yet, I signed a football scholarship to come to an institution with a whole lot of resources and now a term I use called social capital just shot out the room. Now I don't even realize it. Off the strength of a phone call. I don't even know if I was deserving of that. Off the field? Yeah, I did. Yeah, okay. We're talking about man. We're talking about father. We're talking about mentor, leader, community. We're talking about being, having a life of purpose. Why don't you come work for us? Wait a minute. What do you mean work? Like, do what? I don't know about law. But well, we heard you was interested in crime. <laughs> 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 I walked out that door and I cried. I cried. I said, man, God, you can't do dirty tricks on me. I don't get this thing. One minute I'm in the hot seat, the next minute I'm getting the opportunity to work with. Really, though? Scared to talk about it. Scared to share some of that with someone that could actually help. Scared to admit that there was love out there for me as well. Scared of that. Didn't want it. Didn't want to set myself up to be disappointed and hurt again. At all. Affected my schoolwork. Affected my decision. To this day, not sure why. And it didn't affect playing football other than my first year of academics. Fortunate enough to have a pretty decent. Didn't step up to be a leader when it was time. Say that again. I didn't step up to be a leader. I wasted too much time wallowing and focusing on my pain from childhood instead of looking forward. Again, a little Bible. Talking about plowing the field. What can't you do? Can you look back? Can you look right? I work for this law firm, it's great. I get a job, I can take care of my child. Job doesn't work out the first year. 
I want to go to graduate school. What? You got a 227. Bad guy, walk with college. You talking about going to school? You think I got caught? Jones. I didn't have to call because I was still coming back up there, going out to eat big old steaks because I had worked for them whenever they had parties. He said, well, he want to go to school. Well, guess who he went to school to? Well, the graduate director of the University of South Carolina. Not sure if I deserved it, but it was there on the plate waiting for me to take it. These things are here on campus, off campus, alumni waiting for you to take it. Y'all don't have to leave Waffle College without a plan. If you don't have an internship before you leave there, you're wrong. I'm telling you, you're wrong. If you're not shaking hands and thanking alumni when they come to you after those games, don't be a knucklehead and start thinking about where you're going to go hang out. Think about your future. That's going to always be there. I wouldn't go sometime. I don't want to go over there for what? Go front, be fake. Shutting down opportunity that I was afforded, young and dumb. They wrote letters of support. They asked for three letters to go to graduate school. I had six. Had a 2.27. Didn't think I could get in based on my grades. I got an interview. I prepared for the interview. Oh, I'm going to win. Those life lessons of football, not quitting. Oh, you cramping up now. It's all in your body now. Oh, my back hurt. No, it was all in my head. When you got to push through. That 10th day or that 14th day, two a day, you don't know what it feels like when you're in the real world. It ain't nothing but a mind game. Your body won't hurt. You can tell yourself anything. I was able to reach back to some of those lessons I got here at Waffle College, what I call informal education, not in the classroom, not in a book. They didn't coach me from no book. They coached me from here. They believed in me. They demanded the best. I wasn't even demanding the best out of myself because I didn't believe I deserved it. That's what some of us wallow in. I hear coach say some of us got it and some of us don't. Why? All you do is watch the man in front of you, the man that's doing it before you. Mimic, imitate, whatever big word you smart waffle college kids want to use. No, not focus. That's why. When we all go through it, I want to help you, not go through it. They wrote the letters. I got a conditional acceptance in the graduate school. Conditional means you can't make less than a B. If anybody knows about grad school, I ain't gonna do it. You can't make less than a B anyway. So on, on, on his face, it looked like that I wasn't qualified, but I was. I get accepted. I don't get any funding, which means that I had to pay my way to go to school. I didn't get a job like research, research assistants do. The only mentor I had, the only black male professor I ever had in my life, passed away last week. He hired me in the Violence and Substance Abuse Prevention Center at the University of South Carolina in 1995 and paid me $10 an hour to drive him to middle schools all over the state and make presentations about alcohol and drug abuse prevention. Another person in my life that believed in me, I'm not even sure I deserved it. I didn't have the grades that the rest of the kids were applying, and I ended up making more money than they did. Getting much better research experience than what they did. I'm talking about being fortunate and being blessed and understanding that responsibility and owing everyone in the room. I'm talking about really growing up. I'm talking about taking it by the home. Being serious with your life, understanding that you're going to always owe somebody, and that's a good thing. Brown Pickle and Gail says were the first interracial roommates in the NFL. Interracial roommates. I got to walk from college with a young man named Aldo Camusi. <laughs> I called him crazy one morning at camp. <coughs> Who's this scholarship kid always smiling, talking to me as a walk on, calling me crazy? I don't know, man. I didn't mean nothing by it. I saw you run into a kickoff to the wedge, head on three times in a row, and it didn't stop. <laughs> crazy to me. He started laughing. 
Since time, we break bread together. Aldo became my stockbroker. Aldo sat me down in those breakfast checks that you have to make with the Dow Jones, with a newspaper. He said, come on, let me teach you something. Student of life, you want to learn. I may mean, not have to do it in the classroom, but I got so many lessons here at Waffle College. It's the differences that made us attractive to each other. He knew nothing about race. He's Italian and Venezuelan. He didn't carry this anger that I carried. He wanted to understand that why. I was like, well, I'm not exactly sure. First year, Waffle College took me home for spring break with him and both were right to on the floor. At that moment, it was the third richest city in the nation. We went through two armed guards to get to his home. All of them addressed him as Mr. Caruso. He was 19 years old. I was confused. I had never been out of state in South Carolina. What are you talking about? Red Lobster looked like our McDonald's. That McDonald's looked like our Red Lobster. That was my little analogy. There were bubbles on people's houses. I was like, what is that bubble? He's like, that's not a bubble. That's the owner of the Atlanta Hawks. He built a gym for his son. He started changing my, my whole trajectory and understanding that, wow, these are real people here. I don't have to accept where I'm from. I can be raise the expectations in my life and in my community. He taught me one dollar was just as valuable as a thousand. Made my first investment for me. Took me to my first World Series baseball game. I sat behind home plate behind Alex Rodriguez and Derek G. And the Cleveland Indians played tomorrow. Exposure. When you're in them classrooms, when you're walking off this practice field, get to know each other. My lifelong friends graduated from Waffle College and went through two days with me. Fat brother and Paul. Those are my resources now. When my daughter wants to be interested in finances, I got one of my football players from Waffle College to pick up the phone and call. She don't have to navigate life like that and be confused. You don't have to navigate life confused, Quay. We're here. Take advantage of us, fellas. That's what resources are about. We want to balance the playing field. <clears throat> So I go to USC, get a master's degree in criminal justice. I start doing research on alcohol and drug offenses committed by juveniles in three counties in the state. Um, Florence, um, Richmond, and, and Greenland. And we came up with this whole idea that you, we could reduce juvenile incarceration if we have alternative programs to incarceration. This is I was the first juvenile drug court coordinator for the state of South Carolina. Ironic, right? I just started talking about 1985-86 being what, selling what? Look at the opportunity to grow. If you don't stunt your growth, maybe society won't eat. There are people out there that believe in they in this room and keep honing on that. You gotta believe it for yourself. I get the opportunity, do a good job, wasn't satisfied. Wasn't enough for us. I decided to get another master's certificate in alcohol and drugs because I really want to understand some of the thinking and how addictions actually happen and what we can do to prevent it. I went back to school. That didn't work out. We're making enough money. Now I got a little greedy, right? I need more bread in my pocket. I'm in the courtroom watching, observing. And I see this thing called bail. $25,000, $30, whatever. I go to some of my colleagues, some attorneys, say, what does it mean? They explain the system to me. I get my bail bonding license. I start getting people out of jail for a living. The same friends that I was talking about, from Crack Street in 85 and 86, guess who was my clients now? They were. What if I would have 1.54? What if I would have come home then? Have this conversation would have been different. I started getting them out of jail. I want to create some programs to help. While I'm doing this, I start growing up in the side. I think I owe some people some phone calls. I think it's time to send some terrier club some thankfulness. I finally came back to Wofford after that. The last coach might come meet me. 
I met with all my coaches that were still here. And I had the heart to heart conversation that I didn't have when I was a student and a player for him here at Walker College. And man, it hurt. But if you're really about change, really about growth, and really about going and being responsible, you're going to face it. All of us are going to face that adversity one day. All of us are going to get that telephone call. But you're going to answer it. What's going to be the question? Same analogy in your own this real life. It don't change. This, this team thing is about life lessons. Community, family, team. You can't do it by yourself. You got to be bonded. Much stronger. I blame myself for being a leader here and dividing my team at, at one point. I was having players choose sides. Simply because I needed that to feel good about where I was. Oh man, go ahead. No food in the mind. Oh man, the receivers, they wear white shirts. 18 returning stars in 1993. I'm supposed to be a leader here. We went six and five. That's my regret. I let them down. There were some seniors not coming back. I didn't give them the mental effort that I gave them that they deserved. I'm bothered by that every day. Don't have that. Don't have that. Embrace this moment right now. Give these people, teammates, what they deserve. That's your best effort. Unselfishness. I was selfish at the time. I needed the light shining on me because there were some issues going on. The light should have been shining on the team, and I should have worked with issues out for that language. But I let my internalizing the pain and getting away. Don't be that story. Don't call me 10 years and say, Chad, you going back to Waffle? Can I co-speak with you? Not with that story. Not one I'm proud of. I want to use it as a prevention tool so you don't have to go through it. I made some money in this bail button. More money I'd ever seen before. But I was getting people out of jail at the most vulnerable time. It's amazing what God can do to you. I start thinking about life in a different way. I decided to turn it back in. First six months, I made 72 grand when I first started getting people out of jail. That following year, I was fortunate enough to make over $100,000 a year for six years. I bought houses. My daughter went to private school. My mother was living good. Changing my gender ratio. Imagine if I don't have the support of my college. Wasn't good enough. Fell in love with teaching at the time. I was teaching at Benedict. I decided I wanted to go back to school to earn a PhD. Who do you think I call again? Call the principal. <coughs> well, I'll do anything for you. But I ain't too sure about calling the University of Delaware. <laughs> It was right after that uh, 2003 um, semifinals game. Make a long story short, I know I've been long winded today, but there's a lot I need to tell you. I owe you a whole lot. There's a lot, a lot I need to share with you. I get into this PhD program on conditional basis again, right? Cost me $10,343 to go to the school. Get some pay for it. I was prepared now. I wasn't that same young kid. I wanted something. That was a goal I knew I could achieve. I paid for it and went and made $16,300 a year after making 100 grand for six years in a row. That's what it took. It takes sacrifice to achieve your goals. I'm a doctor now. I'm in a 1% of fraternity. In the country, not the race, just overall who earns a child of degree in your field. I'm a criminologist, and I'm not bragging, I'm sharing, because you can vicariously see. No smart, no better, but perse perseverance, determination, faith, and a great work ethic. That, with that social capital and support that you have in this room, have in the classroom, have on campus, and the alumni that graduated. Graduated last year with my doctorate. That's why I didn't get a chance to see y'all last year because uh, I was up under that table writing 12, 13, 14 hours a day. Fortunate enough, I got a tenure track line, which means that someone wants to invest in me for the rest of my life. <coughs> I'm an assistant professor now in the Sociology and Criminal Justice Department at Delaware State University. The 
first semester there, I got invited to speak at Yale University. This kid from Dirt Road with a 1.54 first semester got invited to one of the best colleges in the nation. And they wanted to hear what I had to say about my research. That's what I mean about opportunity to see the moment and grow. I believe in you, fellas. My phone number is easily available. Email some of the fellas. I got good bonds with. We talk. I don't want to bring anybody out, but been out in the communication for two or three years. You don't have to figure this thing out unless you want to. And it's not just me. Because I take these opportunities and I go back to my alumni as well. And I tell all the boys, hey, y'all know I'm going to the school. I got a couple messages for the DBs too, but we'll talk about that. Baylor's going to throw it in the air, so we got some conversation to have. We got some messages to bring you, you know. <laughs> but um, I really just want to end this by saying, um, don't wait till tomorrow. You don't have to wait until tomorrow. It's a problem. You got some support system. Trust, have faith, and believe in your social capital. And please take advantage of it. They really do care. You don't have to fight this world by yourself. Thank you.